Welcome to the third screencast on health and disease. This screencast deals with the immune system. Okay, so the first slide here requires you to be able to define the following things, the immune response, antigen, antibody. Okay, so dealing with those in turn, the immune response. Okay, this is a specific response to a pathogen which involves the activation of lymphocytes and the production of antibodies. Okay, so the response is involved um, production of what we call memory cells as lymphocytes and antibodies. It's what we call an immune response. What's an antigen? Okay, an antigen is a molecule that stimulates an immune response. Okay, these are uh, molecules, proteins or glycoproteins that um, that are, sit on the cell surface membranes of cells or viruses, uh, which our body recognises as being foreign uh, when they invade our, our our cells, our tissues, and um, they elicit an immune response. Okay, so we have um, antigens on our own cells, but our immune system recognises those as belonging to us and does not elicit an immune response. Okay, so it only immune responses only occur to foreign cells, okay, be they bacterial cells, be they viruses, be they protozoans, or cells from another individual, hence the problem with tissue rejection following transplant surgery, okay. And lastly here we have antibodies, okay, these are protein molecules which are produced by B lymphocytes, and we'll come and study B lymphocytes later on, Okay, and they are chemicals or proteins that can neutralize these antigens or the cells that are <coughs> the cells that uh, have these antigens on them. Okay, and we'll look at uh, antibodies and how they work in considerable detail in a further slide. Okay, so moving on to the next slide. This next slide looks at primary defences against pathogens. Um, as, we've, uh, as I've mentioned, um, <clears throat> the body's tissues provide an ideal environment for the growth of microorganisms. The fact that they're warm, ideal temperature for growth, is provided with a constant supply of oxygen and a constant supply of food molecules would make it a fantastic environment for any microorganism to grow. The problem with the growth of these microorganisms is that they would then compete with our own body cells for oxygen and food molecules, and they could also produce um, toxic, um, toxic uh, chemicals, which could uh, be toxic towards our own cells. Hence, um, we invest a huge amount of energy in trying to prevent uh, microorganisms for, from invading our own tissues. Okay, and the first. The first primary defence involves physical barriers such as the skin. Okay, so the skin down here provides a physical barrier through which um, microorganisms can't penetrate. Okay, and some of the secretions into the skin, um, such as sweat and the sebum from the sebaceous glands, have antiseptic properties. Okay, they contain um, fatty acids. Sebum contains fatty acids, for example, which can be poisonous towards. Um, bacteria, sweat with its high salty environment uh, would also be antiseptic okay, or antimicrobial. Okay, so that's uh, the, what the skin does. As well as that we have mucosal membranes um, around our orifices which release a substance called mucus. Okay, and mucus also has antiseptic function, contains enzymes called lysozymes which specifically break down um, bacteria. Okay, so as well as that, um, in more detail, I could look below for a diagram here. <clears throat> it looks at various things. So obviously the skin is the main area that covers most of our body, but um, the skin needs to be penetrated um, at various points for various reasons. Eyes, nose, mouth, um, genital organs, urinary tract, anus, um, all of these um, um, orifices are points of potential potential entry for um, pathogens okay so we um, need to try and protect these areas so eyes okay so the tears that we produce contain an enzyme called lysozyme which is antimicrobial okay and it's an enzyme which breaks down bacteria 
The respiratory tract produces mucus, okay, so the mucosal membranes that surround mucus, okay, which has uh, antimicrobial function too. Okay, also the cilia you learnt about when you studied the um, the respiratory tract, um, managing to waft uh, pathogens and dust particles away from the lung surface. Uh, antibodies can actually um, come into the to to the alveoli as well from the blood supply. And there's macrophages you learnt about that uh, line the alveoli as well, which are there to protect against um, disease. And those macrophages which are invaded by the tuberculosis or my mycobacterium tuberculosis that we've recently studied as well. Okay, so digestive tract also has mu mucus. Okay, the the mouth and the uh, esophagus has mucus. In the stomach, you've got a particular type of mucus, which is highly acidic, which is antimicrobial, okay? Um, and then the genital urinary tract, okay? Urine itself is a, uh, um, would be antimicrobial, okay? So there's the constant washing of urine from the genital urinary tract, okay? Uh, and also the um, acids produced by secretions in the vagina. Um, so those are all examples of <clears throat> primary defences against disease. Okay, so just going back up here to summarise all of that. Okay, so primary defence against pathogens, barriers to infection, so the skin and the mucosal membranes down here, which we talk about, um, which produce mucus, okay, acids in the stomach and the vaginal acids, would be primary defences against disease and the antibacterial enzyme lysozyme which you get tears but as well as getting lysozyme and tears you can find that in mucus also okay uh, as well as blood clotting would be another um, primary defence against disease to try and prevent entry of um, bacteria into <clears throat> the bloodstream at a, at a site of a wound okay earwax as well would be an example of uh, a mechanism to try and prevent entry of um, pathogens. So moving on to the next slide. This slide deals with um, phagocytes, okay, which we learnt about at GCSE. These phagocytes are um, white blood cells which um, pass through the um, the bloodstream and the lymphatic system and what they do is that they engulf bacteria and uh, and then break it down okay so there's two types we find neutrophils and macrophages okay and uh, so what these do is they recognize antigens um, on the on the pathogenic cells okay so they recognize these antigens which are uh, these proteins or glycoproteins which uh, we recognize as not belonging to us okay on pathogenic cells they bind to the pathogen and then engulf it, okay, and uh, what they then do is they then break down the, um, the pathogens um, using hydrolytic enzymes, okay. So here's um, a pathogenic bacteria, okay, it's been recognised um, because of its antigens on it by this phagocyte. So what it does is engulfs it, okay, it engulfs it into this um, membrane-bound um, region which is called a phagosome okay and then lysosomes or lysosomes uh, ly sorry lysosomes which are um, things you would have learned about in F211 then fuse with the phagosome releasing digestive enzymes into this phagosome and then the phagosome those digestive enzymes then break down the bacteria okay I've got a little um, animation of that below So here comes our phagocyte, and here is our bacteria. <clears throat> First thing that happens is the phagocyte recognizes antigens on the cell surface of the bacteria. So here would be the antigens 
recognised by the phagocyte, by receptor molecules on the phagocyte. is engulfed by the phagocyte into this structure called a phagosome and then the lysosomes then fuse with the phagosome releasing enzymes, these green dots are enzymes, digestive enzymes Okay, so hopefully that illustrates this process below quite nicely. Okay, so first of all, recognition, antigen, recognizing antigen on bacteria, engulfing bacteria into phagosome, lysosomes then secrete enzymes into phagosome, which breaks down the, um, the bacteria inside the phagosome. Okay, what we'll <coughs> find out later on as well is what happens after this, is that the antigens are then presented on the cell surface of these of these phagocytes and we'll look at that on another slide so this slide deals with the structure of antibodies okay the structure of antibodies so it consists of four polypeptide chains here's one of the polypeptide chains here here's another of the polypeptide chains here and here's a third one and here's a fourth one. And as you can see, the polypeptide chains are held together by disulfide bridges. Okay? Which you remember from our look at protein structure are covalent bonds between cysteine amino acids. Okay? A cysteine amino acid, an amino acid that's got an R group with a sulfur atom in it. Okay? So that's the, the basic structure. There are different regions on this structure which we need to consider. First of all, the constant region, which is this part of the molecule down here. And that constant region is the bit that is recognised by phagocytes. Uh, and we'll come back to look at the function of these antibodies on the next slide. But anyway, for this slide, that's just the constant region, and that is recognised by phagocytes. We've got the variable regions up here, and those are specifically... Or these specifically recognise antigens, okay? And we'll we'll talk about how we manage to produce different variable regions for different antigens on a subsequent slide as well, okay? So the idea is here is this bit at the tip here is that it is recognised by um, or these recognised antigens, okay? There's also a region here. Okay, which we call the hinge region. And the hinge region allows a bit of flexibility. So it allows these, these bits which contain the variable region to move around. Okay? And the significance of that flexibility is it allows these to bind to two antigen molecules, okay? which um, enables the molecule to cross-bridge um, antigens, which um, is significant uh, process called agglutination which we'll look at on another slide as well. Okay so that describes the structure of an antibody with its four polypeptides held together by disulfide bridges with its constant region, with its variable region and its hinge region and you should know what the hinge region, the variable region and the constant region all do. Anyway moving on to the next slide Having looked at the structure of antibodies, this slide here investigates the mode of action of antibodies, and there are various ways that antibodies work, but we're going to focus in on two uh, modes of action, neutralization and agglutination. Okay, so we're going to first of all, I'm going to first of all actually look at this one, agglutination. Um, this, because of the structure of antibodies, because of the because of the, the fact that the, there are two variable regions, each which can bind to an antigen, okay, it means that this can actually bind to 
antigens on two different pathogens and therefore forming a cross bridge between the two pathogens. Okay, and that can clump pathogens together. Okay, and then what happens is that our phagocyte comes along, recognize the constant region, and then engulfs the clumped together pathogens. Okay, so here I have some bacteria which have been clumped together by these antibodies, and the constant regions of these antibodies would then um, be recognized by by uh, phagocytes, which could then come and engulf this um, this collection of pathogens. Okay, so that's agglutination. Okay, now the next one we're going to look at is neutralization. This is when the antibody binds to an antigen, and that antigen is an integral part of the the whole life cycle of the pathogen. Okay, so by binding to that antigen, we disrupt the life cycle of the pathogen. Okay, this typically could be a virus. The virus might have an antigen molecule, which is also a molecule which enables that virus to enter into its host cell. So if we can bind to that antigen, we disrupt that ability of the virus to be able to enter into the host cell. Okay, um, another example of neutralization is um, anti snake uh, venom. Um, so, so I think venom um, would be a protein molecule of some sort, and there'd be some aspect of that protein, some some molecule with a specific shape, which makes that molecule toxic. Okay, so if we can actually bind to that bit of the molecule, it prevents the molecule from being toxic. Okay, so that's um, how it could neutralize a snake venom. An antibody can be used to neutralize snake venom. Okay, so I'm going to now show you a little animation of. Um, neutralization, a possible um, scenario for neutralization below. See here I've got some blood coming through an artery and here we have a pathogen of some sort. And that pathogen has on it that pathogen has on it some I'll just wind it back a bit. It has this molecule on it here, which is a specific shape, which is complementary to the shape of a receptor molecule on a host cell. So this could be a host cell, okay? And for this pathogen to gain entry into this host cell, these molecules need to bind to this receptor molecule here. Okay? So moving along. So what the antibody does so what the antibody does is it binds to these molecules on the pathogen. Okay, so it binds to all these molecules on the pathogen. which means that the pathogen can't bind to these receptor molecules and therefore can't actually get into the host cell. What then happens is because of the constant regions on these antibodies, it's recognized by this phagocyte here, which comes along and engulfs it. Okay, so hopefully that has illustrated neutralization and agglutination. Okay, you've got to know what these, be able to describe both of these processes here. Okay, so moving on to the next slide. This slide here um, looks at the um, mode of action of T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes. Uh, including the significance of cell signaling and the role of memory cells. Okay, this is, I think, one of the the most detailed, if you like, storylines that you have to learn at AS Biology. Okay, so it might take me a little bit of time, but we'll go through. Okay, I've split it up into uh, three bits. Okay, three bits. I say it's a great big long storyline. All of these um, bullet points here being important. Okay, but I've split it into three subsections. Okay, the first thing that happens is what we call antigen presentation. 
Okay, so what happens is the pathogen is engulfed by a macrophage, okay, or a neutrophil, and what then happens is, uh, as I alluded to when we looked at this earlier on, is that when we looked at the phagocyte engulfing a pathogen, is the macrophage engulfs and breaks down that uh, pathogen, but it, then it presents the antigen on the cell surface membrane of the phagocyte or, or uh, macrophage. Okay, so that's uh, what we call antigen presentation by macrophage. And I've got a little slide below, which um, little animation which shows that happening here. So here I've got a pathogen with its antigens on it, okay, and it is about to be engulfed by this macrophage. In come the lysosomes, break it down, and then what happens is that the antigens are then displayed on the cell surface, okay? And then what happens is along comes a T cell with a complementary let's quickly go back. So here we've got a T cell here, which is going into the what we call clonal selection. Now there are all sorts of different types of T cell, but there will be a particular T cell which will specifically recognize this antigen here. Okay, so the idea is that we've got a whole armory of T cells, okay, and there is a T cell somewhere which will recognize every possible different types of antigen. Okay, and eventually what will happen is the T cell, which is complementary to this antigen, will bind to the antigen which has been presented on the cell surface of this macrophage, okay, and that's known as clonal selection, okay, so we select the right type of T cell which is complementary in that it's got a receptor molecule which recognizes, because it's complementary in shape, to the antigen. Okay, so that deals with that. So we've, we've seen the, mac the macrophage presenting its antigen on the cell surface. Okay, and then what we've done, we've gone through, and we actually showed you the next bit, if you like, the clonal selection. Okay, as I say, you've got millions of different types of T lymphocyte, okay, in your bloodstream and in your lymphatic system. Okay, and there will be one of these lymphocytes which will recognize this antigen, okay, because it's complementary in shape, or it's got a receptor which is complementary in shape to that antigen, okay, and once that is bound to the antigen, okay, on the cell surface of the macrophage, and that process is called clonal selection, i.e. We've, we've selected the right clone of our lymphocytes with the right um, antigen receptor molecule on it, what then happens is that the um, the lymphocyte is activated and divides, okay, so it divides, it uh, then starts to divide by mitosis into lots and lots of different cells, okay, and then those cells then differentiate into different types of T lymphocyte, and this is known as clonal expansion, okay, so we the, uh, the clone that we've selected then expands to produce lots and lots and lots of different cells, but then they're different into three different types. One type is called a T killer cell, which can kill the pathogen. Okay, one is called a T memory cell, um, which um, they hang around in the in the uh, bloodstream and in the lymphatic system for for a long time. Okay, and are there to um, be able to um, to recognize any future invasion of this particular pathogen which has this specific antigen on it. Okay, and I'll look at the significance of these memory cells um, a bit later on. As well as T helper cells, and T helper cells are important in activating B cells. Okay, and we're just about to come and look to see what 
B cells do in a second. Okay, so that's um, quite a complicated um, process. Okay, but I've got another animation below which will help us with that in a second. Okay, so just moving down to the next bit, which is the activation of B lymphocytes. So having having activated our T lymphocytes. We then have other cells called B lymphocytes, which are different types of lymphocytes. Okay, and a B lymphocyte will then recognise the same specific um, pathogen. Okay, and will bind. Uh, will have a an antigen receptor which will bind to that antigen. Okay, so again, clonal selection. We have many, many different types of B lymphocytes, as we did different types of T lymphocytes. Okay, there'll be a specific B lymphocyte which will recognize this particular antigen and will bind to it. Okay, what it then does is the B lymphocyte then engulfs the pathogen, okay, and presents its antigen on its cell surface. Okay, so we now have the antigen prese presented on the cell surface of this specifically selected B lymphocyte. Then the T helper cell, okay, that we've these T helper cells that we've created up here, one of these T helper cells will bind to the presented antigen on the B lymphocyte surface. Okay. What then happens is that stimulates the T helper cell to release a chemical which is called a cytokine. And this is a form of what we call cell signaling when a chemical is released from one cell and that has an effect on another cell. So a chemical is released which then binds to a receptor on the cell surface of another cell and then instructs that cell to do something. And that's known as cell signaling. And in this case the, the, uh, the chemical is called a cytokine. Okay, So the cytokine signals the B cell to divide. Okay, So the B cell then goes through this clonal expansion as well like the T cells did and provide this um, provides two types of cells. B plasma cells, Okay, and these are the the, the cells that release these molecules called antibodies. Okay, and the clever thing here is these antibodies okay, have variable regions on them which are exactly the same as the cell surface receptor on the B cell. Okay, so these will also bind to the same antigens. Okay, and then B memory cells here, which you can only half read, the memory cells here, these remain in the circulatory system and the lymphatic system, okay, and will recognize any future um, invasions of the same pathogen okay so that's a really long storyline I've, I've got a, a little animation below which hopefully illustrates all of that So here I've got my antigen presenting cell, okay, or my macrophage. So we're going right back to the start of the story here, okay. So we've got um, let's say bacteria, which has been recognised by a macrophage, and is going to be engulfed by it, and is going to be uh, broken down, and then it's going to present <coughs> its antigens on its cell surface. So there's the phagosome. In comes the lysosomes, breaks down the pathogen, you don't need to worry about the name of this protein, but it's just the protein that inserts the antigen in the cell surface membrane. So the antigen is now displayed on the cell surface of this macrophage. Now along comes a specific T cell. Okay, this is a T cell which recognizes that antigen. Okay. The T cell then divides, okay, starts dividing. Just take it back a bit there. 
You'll notice here there's also a chemicals being released from the from the macrophage which stimulate the T cell to divide. These are actually called interleukins. So that's another type of cell signaling, but this time a differently named chemical called interleukin, which stimulates the T cell to divide. The T cell is now dividing. That's called clonal expansion. Okay, and the idea here is that we produce different types of T cell. Okay, so we some cells become what are called T killer cells, some cells become T helper cells, okay, and some cells become T memory cells, okay, and uh, these are all important in the immune system, and I'll talk about the memory cells later on, okay. So that's the T cells, okay, now the next part of the story involves B cells. So here's a B cell which also recognizes the bacteria, engulfs the bacteria, in come the lysosomes, the digestive enzymes, breaks down the bacteria. And then we present the antigen on the cell surface of this B cell. Okay, so this has been clonal selection. This is a specific B cell which has specifically recognized the antigen and then presented that antigen on the cell surface. Okay. Along comes a T helper cell now and binds to that antigen. So here comes the T helper cell as bind to the antigen which has been presented on the has been, I'll just go back there again. So the T helper cell has has bound to the B cell, okay, which is presenting the antigen, okay. And then the T helper cell releases a substance called cytokine, which then causes the B cell to divide, okay, so cytokine is stimulating the B cell to divide, and the B cell divides into two types of cell, okay, one is called a memory cell, okay, and another is called a plasma cell, and the plasma cells are the cells that produce antibodies, and the memory cells are the ones that stay around in the, in the circulatory system and in the lymphatic system for many months to come. So the clonal expansion continues, produce lots and lots of cells. So some of them produce antibodies. We call those plasma cells. Okay, so here the plasma cells will start producing antibody. So they start producing these antibodies. Okay, but as well as the uh, plasma cells, we also have these memory cells here, okay, which don't produce antibodies, but what they do is that they stick around and they have these cell surface um, receptors which will recognize any future invasion by the same pathogen with the same antigen on it. Okay. So the antibodies... Okay, then bind to okay, so they can bind to these bacteria, okay, and then they can do one of a number of things, and the the things that we talked about was agglutination 
and neutralization. Okay, so this, for example, could be an example of neutralization where they've actually bind, bound to these bacteria, which prevent these bacteria from entering a host cell. Okay, and also the constant regions of here, the constant regions of these antibodies will recognize or be recognized by phagocytes, which will come along and engulf these. Okay, so hopefully that um, that animation has helped you um, at least visualize what is a very long and involved process, which I split down into three groups to help you understand it all. The antigen presentation by macrophage is the first bit, and then the, the bit which involves T lymphocytes, the clonal selection and clonal expansion of T lymphocytes, and then the clonal selection and clonal expansion of B lymphocytes, okay, and the ultimate production of the specific antibodies to the antigen, okay, and then that links in um, with what the actual antibodies do in terms of agglutination or neutralization. Okay, so that's a, um, an, a very complicated slide, but one that you need to be able to understand. This last slide looks at uh, comparing and contrasting primary and secondary immune responses. Okay, just to explain what all, all that means is what a primary response is, is what we've just um, outlined in the slide before, is that what happens when we're first exposed to a pathogen. Okay, so when we're first exposed to a pathogen, there are very, very few B cells and T cells that exist within the circulatory system which will recognize our antigen. Okay, so it's going to take a, a, quite a while for one of those B, uh, initially one of those T cells, to recognize or to, to collide with and bind to our antigen, which has been presented on the macrophage. Okay, it's going to take a long time just by the virtue of the fact that there aren't very many cells in the circulation system that recognize it. Okay, and also the, um, there'll be very few B cells. Okay, so the um, um, the, the amount of antibody we produce wouldn't be very high either. Okay, Now, during the primary immune response, the rate of the pathogens reproducing would be so high that they would quickly reach a population that would cause symptoms of the disease. Okay, So during your first encounter with the pathogen is that you are likely to um, show some of the symptoms of the disease. Okay, um, And uh, so... The key thing there is it takes a long time for the, the amount of antibodies to start increasing and the amount of antibodies to produce is quite low. Okay, The reason being that there are very few T and B cells in the circulatory system which, are, which would recognise and be complementary in shape to our particular antigen. Okay? Now, because of the memory cells that are produced in this primary immune response, which we talked about in the slide below, the second time that you're exposed to that specific antigen, okay, day 30 here, because the second time there are lots of B cells and lots of T cells, okay, which are both types of memory cell, which will specifically recognize that antigen, is the likelihood of one of these bumping into our antigen is far greater, okay, and therefore it will happen far sooner, and therefore, as you can see, the antibody production starts with only uh, within a day of our second uh, infection with this particular antigen. Okay, so it's a far quicker response to second response. Okay, and because there's lots more uh, T cells and that's all B memory cells, or each of which is undergoing the um, the immune response that we saw in the previous slide, the overall production of antibody is going to be far greater. Okay, because there's far more B cells doing it, if you like, and therefore they're all produce a far more antibody okay so the the b the b memory cells okay what happens is that they will then um, be activated by the the t cells and will start then developing into more plasma cells as well and the more plasma cells will produce more antibody okay which explains that um, massive production of antibody 
in the second response. And in the second response is that the production of antibody is so quick and so massive that we manage to eradicate the, the pathogen before it re reproduces to the extent that it actually causes us any symptoms and therefore we don't have the symptoms of the disease second time around, which explains why we only get chicken pox once. Okay, so this response happens when we first encounter the chicken pox virus and we end up getting the characteristic rash that we get when we have chicken pox. But we encounter chicken pox virus many times throughout our life but never get the disease second time round because this is the response every time, every subsequent time we encounter the chicken pox virus. And this large amount of anti-chicken anti pox antibody will eradicate the chicken pox virus before it actually starts to reproduce in our cells uh, to a sufficient level that it actually causes any, us any symptoms. Okay, so that concludes our look at the immune system.